Cheltenham Festival fast approaching, what better to do than to sit down with a man whose life and career has been intrinsically linked to the Great Meeting. He is award-winning journalist and broadcaster Alistair Down, and Alistair joins me here at the King's Head in Bledington, just a few miles from the racecourse, for a very special edition of Memory Lane. Alistair, thank you very much for coming to well, join good me here. Good to see you here in the King's Head, but they say I'm the second best customer. I shudder to think what the best customer spends. <laughs> so you come here quite frequently. It's so about 182 yards from my okay. home. Yeah. And you are a man who is sort of known for your love and affection for the Cheltenham Festival. You've written a book, um, Cheltenham et al., yeah. I believe. Um, but where did that love for the festival begin? Where, where did it all start? I think it originated early childhood. My dad was a, he was no expert. We grew up, well, I grew up in suburban London, sort of pleasantly healed, but the, I think the closest horse was in North Scars Parade. Um, but he was a punter and he loved it and he loved Cheltenham. And he and mum would go off to the meeting and stay there. They stayed at Upton on seven, Upton under seven, sadly, in recent weeks, mm. um, with some great friends. Uh, he'd been the escape manager at Colditz, would you believe? And oh, uh, nice. he used to come back with tales of the meeting. Um, the first time I think I watched a race with Dad, I think it was about five, and I had the mumps. And I was at home from school, therefore, and Dad had got the mumps as well in his neck. Gosh. And was upstairs in bed, very rare for him to be ill. And he decided that despite having been given the mumps by his horrible son, he would get up and watch the Gold Cup on television. <laughs> as he, I think he put it, as I walked down the stairs, the mumps descended about two foot as well. And he ended up with mumps where a man doesn't need mumps. And it was the only time that his love for me wavered, I think, right. in all his lifetime. <laughs> but uh, that was the first time I remember. But Cheltenham. In my teenage years at school, I had the key to a house a few miles from school and I used to wangle somehow, or I just didn't turn up, um, for the three days um, and go and watch it in black and white up in this house near where the great Peter Caslick trained, Fairlawn okay. in yes. Kent. And uh, I used to watch that on my own, loving every minute, listening to all those O'Sullivan commentaries. And I was much in love with it by the age of 13, 14. I mean, kind of, not obsessed, because that has a sort of unhealthy element to it. I just adored it and was dying to be there. Okay. So, and uh, what was it about the festival in particular? Because obviously you must have developed a love of racing generally. I what developed a love of racing by the age of five, yes. yes. Sitting on Dad's armchair, okay. you know, in the wing as he jumped up and down, shouting at the telly, I would do the same. And all Dads are heroes for their kids, and he was very much a hero to me, right until his dying day. Um, a meek, quiet, mild, humorous man with a genius for friendship. And I used to go and get his... In those days, the London Evening Standard, about 12 editions, one of which was entirely racing, the Midday Standard. Right. I'd go oh, down on the yeah. yeah, go down the Saturday morning and get the Midday Standard from the local... On my bike, uh, last time I rode a bike, so last time I was doing any exercise. Um, <laughs> And we go through the form, and it, I was I was riveted by it. Um, Cheltenham, in particular, something about it, something about the the change of atmosphere on the television, mm. something about the arrival of masses of Irish. Um, I was sort of seven, eight Arkles time. Um, saw him once at Sandown as a child, um, but I was just utterly enraptured by racing in general, jumping in particular, but specifically for the festival. Okay. And so at what point were you able to actually go? The uh, first one, well, this will be my 45th Cheltenham without missing a day. Wow. Um, I first went when I was 19 in that gap year, so called, which people are meant to travel the world and do useful <laughs> things and great works for other people in Africa. <laughs> I didn't know any of that. I went racing. Um, and by some extraordinary coincidence, we got, I was offered the use of a box at Cheltenham which was meant to carry, contain 12 people right on the winning post, owned by a family friend who couldn't go. And I filled this box of 12 with about 40 people, um, all around that age, all kind of racing mad. Uh, it was like the Black Hole Calcutta but more to drink. <laughs> and it was a good day, so much so that I think three or four people woke up at four o'clock the following morning in a siding at Paddington. Wow. Yes, it was a good day. Right. And we had plenty of people coming in giving us winners, and it was all, it was blissful. 
Um, I've never raced in such style at Cheltenham since. <laughs> And so then, uh, obviously, as you say, you, you, you've not missed a day since then. Yep. There must, I mean, the festival, there are incredible stories. You mentioned Arkle there, who's perhaps a little bit before the time you started going. Yep. Um, but talk about some of the, the horses in those sort of early days that really struck a chord with you. Well, I think one of the things I loved in those days, little yards did well at the meeting. Okay. Small stables. I mean... A guy with 15 horses in Wiltshire could go and win a Son of Lance or an RSA or whatever mm. it's called, or a Joe Colfer and other attempts. Small trainers, retired steel workers, whatever, they could go there, not, on, not with a level chance, but with a very good chance. And it wasn't the fiefdom of the big battalions that it is now. It isn't the fiefdom of the people with 60 runners, the Mullins, Elliot, Henderson, Nichols mm. approach, you know, which is fine. You know, it's, it's a, not a thing against it. But I love the little yards who went there with a chance. And also, small yards started a premium price. And in those days, because you go down to the betting ring with your three quid or it was, and somebody would have a horse at 12 to 1, and three rows along, it would be 16. So that's long gone. Mm. You used to shop around, um, and you could get value, or what you thought was value. <laughs> um, and I love the fact that the best laid plans could either be thumpingly successful or horrendously, um, horrendously wrong. Um, <laughs> and you'd sit on horses for months, you call that, that'll win the so-and-so at Chilton. And um, you'd be coming to the last thing and fall over or something like that. And mm. I loved the, the fact that there was no hiding place for horse, owner, trainer, jockey or punter at the meeting. Mm. It's, it's unforgiving, yet remains fabulous because it draws you back in. It never puts you off if things go wrong. You just mm. And all the things that go wrong are better stories. I backed a horse that fell in the paddock once at Chelsea. <laughs> really? We, it would be a thing called Celtic Ball. And it was 89 or 90 in the Coral Final. And it had marginal form, small trainer, and it was... It went on eight to one favour for reasons I couldn't believe. And we'd backed it at 20s, I think. And uh, the Queen Mother turned up the paddock and it went forth and up near and landed smack down on the walkway. And that was the end of the, Well, it ran, but it ran back Didn't quick as I could. <laughs> I think it's the only one I've actually backed that's lost it in the paddock. Okay. It's, it's, that's the perpetual draw of it, isn't it? Is that you, you can win, you can lose, but you, you, you're you involved, I suppose, and that's I think, the key thing. Yeah, it's been my great privilege to be involved, mm. albeit peripherally as a, as a writer and once upon a time as a broadcaster. But... I think what I love about it is, to me, it's the last great racing democracy. I mean, Andrew Marr made a documentary about post-war Britain and he shot some footage at Cheltenham and to his surprise he said there were as many nose studs as trilbies. I mean, <laughs> it's not quite true, but it is much more of a democracy than people think. And mm. everyone's got an opinion, the Duke stands next to the dustman, and I love all that. And, mm. and I love the fact that it's the last meeting where People in large numbers stay away from the meeting. Obviously, the Irish are here for the duration. Uh, but people come from the north and from the far west, and Scotland and home counties, and they stay there. And mm. they go to the same pubs every year, have the same arguments with the same other people they <laughs> see once a year, and the same fights. Um, <laughs> and I love all that. I love the, the community of the meeting. Mm. And we're there. Yes, we're there to watch the racing, watch great deeds, have a bet. We also go there because we know that every year, two or three things, I wrote years ago, will happen that nourish the soul. They're just magical moments. And mm. I can't find that anywhere else. And for atmosphere in sport, there's nothing to match it. So talking of those moments that nourish the soul, are there any that really stick out to you that you'll never forget? Oh, countless. Um, and th th this is the appeal of the thing, isn't it? I mean, every year you're as excited as you were the year before. Mm -hmm. And every year it gets bigger, the meeting. Some say too big, I don't. It would be too big if it went for five days and it won't happen because there'll be a dead body at the main entrance of mine. <laughs> um, I think that would be a disaster for the meeting. They're, it's hard to avoid the cliche memories in a sense, but for drama, spectacle, emotion, I think Dawn Run's Gold Cup is, would be my Desert Island race from the, okay. from the meeting. Um, I'd, my first ever visit to Ireland, 
a couple of years before when Dawn Run was a novice hurdler. And I went to see Paddy Mullins, Willie's dad, um, and was fussed over by Maureen, who's still about age 120 and still <laughs> doing the play spot and still as enthusiastic as ever and still full of beans. And I sat down with Paddy, who'd been a bit of a childhood hero. Anyway, we chatted away. I had an hour with him, but it turned into two and a half or three. And I left convinced that Dawn Run was the best horse he'd ever trained. And this is a man who trained every winner under National Hunt Rules in Ireland and mm. trained champion stakes winners and all sorts. And so we backed Dawn Run for the, for the novice hurdle. And the lad who was meant to ride her got injured. And Ron Barry was entrusted with the ride. And his orders were quite simple. Go off in front, and every time you think you're going too fast, go faster. Right. And when you think it's impossible to go any faster, go faster again, and she will do it. Wow. And dear Ron, who is um, last in credit, in inverted commas, gave her a breather down the hill. Uh, they got to her, and she was beaten by a top-class racehorse called Saban du Loire, with mm. an unknown 50-to-1 shot in third place, West Tip. <laughs> was some novice her. Yes. But I was a, a die-hard fan of hers from then on. And when she rallied that day from the last, to watch it in the flesh uh, was to see wonders unfold in front of your eyes because mm. she was beaten for all money. Um, she was going to finish fourth, and she won. That's it. And the post-race scenes, Charmin and Leon have been carried around the paddock, and she was 70-odd and been riding the horse in races. Right. Oh, God. I didn't know that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. She was a strong-willed woman. <laughs> well, you did uh, mention earlier about the fact that you were obviously a broadcaster for a long time. And mm -hmm. I have to say, um, part of my love of the festival and, and racing in general is, is owed to the Channel 4 coverage of that time. You know, you only needed to say, welcome back to Cheltenham, everybody, and the hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. But that really was... were already. Yeah. <laughs> that really was a great team. I think it was great. I think it was a great team, and it was great fun to do it. Um, and I think Andrew Franklin, who was the genius presiding over the thing, um, who invented Channel 4 Racing, I think his contribution to the status and the ever-increasing momentum the meeting has in the sporting calendar is not to be underestimated. I think their coverage um, was a huge help to the meeting. It okay. brought the meet. It brought the... It took the tweediness out and brought the contact in. Yes. You know, it was, when the program started, it was like the curtains opening, you just saying like, come on in, this is it. You can't be here, but we, we're going to bring, bring it to you. Mm. And it was a thrill to, it was a thrill to do it. Um, you know, I've had those days where you've, I remember the Gold Cup long run one when um, Corto Star and Denman were, blitzing each other down the hill. I think I said like two mad old pensioners out for the last <laughs> hurrah. And just watching it, talking about hair standing up the back of your neck, and I just thought, let's get this program over and get me at that laptop. I just want to write down what it felt like to watch that. Okay. And I'm emotional right now. Yeah. I'm very hardwired into the meeting. You know, I've seen disasters there tragedies there yes to horse and to human um yes it's great celebration carnival or fetes as the french would say but it's very hard-edged yeah. and yeah. the tiny gap between triumph and disaster can just grow into an abyss mm. and you're always aware of that in the back of your mind that and you talk to people who know the place well, say from the saddle. You know, you listen to, I've sat and talked endless nonsense with Ruby Walsh down the years, but to listen to him talk about how to ride it and the things you try not to do, mm. um, it's fascinating because he takes you out there mm. and you suddenly get, you get into your head something we don't do when we watch races that, Jockeys, the good ones, are thinking about a dozen things a minute mm. outside of what they're actually doing on their own horse. Um, and Ruby has eyes, not in the back of his head, but I think he has a set all round. Mm. It's one of the reasons he's such a great judge, because he sees things in races that other people have missed.
That's right. We know. And it's a battle. Remember, it's a battle between those individuals for all the wonderful camaraderie of the way room. You know, they are out there to assassinate each other politely mm. when it comes to, you know, this is, this is their massive day of the year for a guy with, say, one important ride at the meeting and a lot of other scrubbers or four or five other scrubbers. Um, it has to go right. Mm. You know, people have been dreaming of this day for years. What's that? Why is it that the Cheltenham Festival is so significant to racing people? I think the savagery of the test is an important part. Uh, I think the race course presents challenges that no other course does. Um, and also, you have to remember, it's fun. <laughs> You've got 60 or 70,000 people, some of whom have saved up decent money through the years either to get in or to get in and have a punt. Um, it's the sheer sort of joie de vie of the thing. Mm. All those people enjoy themselves. Where else do you get that noise when the tapes go on? Of course. It's, yeah. it's here, it's here. We're off, we're going. Right, hold on for dear life. And you have to. And yeah. I like the fact that uh, money has little value. It's like something out of a board game, you go to the sports board on the wall and say, I want more, I want more, I want more. Um, and it doesn't really matter. We get caught up in it, hopelessly, and it's as intoxicating every year as the previous one. Mm. Yes, there are vintage meetings and meetings, that, but they're never anything other than brilliant. Just sometimes they transport you to places you didn't really think you could possibly travel to. And I love the fact that you are one of tens of thousands, all hell-bent on the same piece of passion for four days. Yeah. And there's nothing else like it. My kids never miss a day at the festival, but they wouldn't know there was a race course anywhere else in the country. This just happens mm. from their early days. You know, their house would be full of people sleeping on the floor and strange people would take to school and everyone would be busy <laughs> about and people be up till five in the morning, people be up all night. and. And the house was madness, and all their parents' sort of greatest chums would turn up, and the atmosphere caught them from the age of four, five, six, and they wouldn't miss a day. Mm. Uh, but they wouldn't know where Fontball Fakenham was, um, mm. and as for things without chumps, they not a clue there. So. But they wouldn't miss a day, and all their mates. And what I love is that the fact that that generation in their 20s are as passionate about it as aging loons such as myself and I love the fact that it transmits across the generations mm. and that's another part of the democracy of celebration that the place offers. There is nowhere like it and once that atmosphere has been tasted people will go back year after year come hell or I want. As you have and you will continue yeah. to do so. Damn right. Yeah. Alistair thank you very very much. Better. That's fantastic.